Thank you all for being here. My name is Abdurrahman Maddalla, and I go with Abdul to make your life a little bit easier. And uh, I was uh, helping Munira to, in organizing the symposium Expertise Exposed, Consultancy in the Gulf. Um, the title we found is pretty intriguing. We, hear, we keep hearing about this from our speakers, that it's a really interesting title. And uh, it's uh, pretty interesting how it came all together. It, uh, we just freezed it there because we felt that it, it kind of describes a phenomena that we're interested in, um, the presence of uh, expertise in the Gulf. Uh, uh, the, it's both the local and the global expertise that has been involved in the development of uh, major cities and uh, large developments in the uh, Gulf. Okay. Yeah, so we asked questions, we wandered around, and we asked questions uh, to students, non-architects mostly, and wanted to uh, have a feel about uh, what do be people, other students, think of um, the development in the region and the architecture there? Uh, um, yeah, the uh, question was, do you know where the Arabian uh, Gulf is? You have the UAE, you have Yemen, Oman, Saudi Arabia. Um, you also have India, which isn't part of the Middle East, but they do have um, the country, like it borders the Arabian Gulf. Um, you have Pakistan, you have that entire region there. Mm, yeah. Dubai. Dubai. The one in Dubai? It's Dubai. It's in Dubai. Yeah. <laughs> Dubai. There's the Burj Khalifa, which is the tallest building in the world. I'd say it's different. I would say up and coming. Rich. Prosperous. Right now, conflict, just because of the news media here. Developed or up and coming? Maybe eclectic. Beauty. Breathtaking. Hot. Awesome. Cultural. <laughs> Maybe colorful? Uh, it looks like uh, tremendous. Dubai is modernizing rapidly. Um, I know there's an architecture award called the Aga Khan Architecture um, Award, and it's gives it's been given out I think every ten years or five years, and um, a lot of their buildings and a lot of their awards go to people in the Middle East. But it's absolutely lovely. Oh, really nice. No, they, it sounds very nice city. A really really nice city. Very modern, right? The first thing that comes in mind is like dome structure. Um, but now I think they're um, getting out of that uh, stereotype and then uh, going for more high rises. For example, like the Burj Khalifa, they made it um, a tall skyscraper, but still, if you look from the top, it's like um, a lotus or a flower. <laughs> Okay, so the words that we heard are um, that it's different, unique, rich, modernizing rapidly, tremendous, and I like how he said it, awesome and hot, um, and indeed uh, cities of the Gulf are viewed uh, differently. They are unique in their uh, march to situate themselves on the economic network of global cities. The discovery of oil underground led to fast-paced development above ground. And while there is fear of depleting resources, fueling construction of mega-scale developments, and unique architectural projects is, reluctic, is reluctant to stop or change. And so you can see that the Gulf cities continue um, to invite these, to invite um, international class standard and global consultancies to mediate the future of these cities. Um, in conjunction with local expertise. These challenges are still happening, um, and, in con and 
together, they're also inviting um, more expertise, and this is still an ongoing phenomenon. And so we approach this symposium to expose this continued phenomenon um, of hiring global and local expertise to develop the past and the future of the global cities. So this project started. Mm -hmm. you wanna tell the story? Yeah, so it, uh, it really came from the ground up. Uh, the, I mean, the story is pretty long, but to make it pretty short for you, I was sitting in the lab downstairs, and Munira was uh, pretty interested in what I had on the ma on on my screen, which was a, a map of Saudi Arabia. And uh, she approached me and introduced herself, and uh, we thought we shared ideas about the symposium. And uh, from our basic encounter, we uh, in the computer lab, this symposium was put in place. We shared the theme uh, in one day, and on the second day, it was put into reality. And uh, I always give this analogy that uh, I approached Munira with an ID, and uh, that she was the spark that put it all on fire and made it a cool thing. <laughs> no, she's always saying this story, but um, it's all together, I think. Um, but we're very fortunate to um, have Professor Sinin and um, Professor Anda French to help us continue and make this project uh, happening reality. And thank you, speakers, for coming here, and students and staff and everyone here. Thank you. And so I think it's time to start. Yes. Yes. Uh, we so actually, uh, one more thing. We really need to thank uh, the team uh, who helped us uh, with organizing this. And uh, uh, I'm going to call them by name. Our Ashley Marshall, who is the president of SMAD. Dominique, who's uh, the president of ASO, Jessica Rogers, who helped us with uh, the uh, putting the f funding and uh, the budget, Sai, Lorraine, and Miriam, Nicolita, and Rajwa. All of you guys, thank you. Hey. Uh, good afternoon and welcome. Um, I'm Francisco Sanin. I'm the current chair of the graduate program. And an almost invisible participant, uh, Munira and Abdul have made uh, an incredible job uh, putting together, organizing, and structuring, and dealing with all the logistics and getting uh, to have with us some amazing speakers that are, I'm sure will make uh, for a wonderful present discussion. Uh, I always like to say that uh, our program, our school, uh, reflects many of the things that are going on around the world. And one of them, of course, is uh, increased exchange of ideas, the flow of ideas, uh, expertise, <laughs> consultancy. But more than that, uh, of paradigms of what uh, we as a society and uh, as a community value, and how we construct ourselves and the mechanism by which that is constructed. We have about 30 some uh, citizenships represented in the school, which is quite amazing. Um, and remarkably, if we were to make a, a chart, which probably I should have done, uh, you would have found that the Middle East uh, is really well represented in our demographics, but very little is known about it. So in that flow and that exchange of ideas, uh, there is a very silent partner. And it's one that I think at the social level, at the media level, we uh, have paid very little respect in allowing the stereotypes to be a replacement for knowledge. And so hopefully, this is uh, a long overdue um, symposium that wants to deal with and study and allows us to uh, discuss, deep, uh, let's say deeply as much as we can, into a society that, uh, to say the least, plays a daily life role in our lives, whether it's through oil, money flows, cultural exchanges, products, uh, support for architectural firms, consultancy firms. So uh, if we were to make a map again of the flow, whether it's of energy, uh, economy, jobs, 
I'm sure we'll find uh, the Middle East to play a prominent role. So the fact that we, uh, particularly in this part of the world, don't look at it carefully, we don't analyze it carefully, uh, and have not really uh, done the, the necessary research of how it actually has constructed or is constructing our own body of knowledge, how it affects our uh, discipline, and how it in that, uh, well, I, I, won't, I won't give a lecture. I promised myself I, I wouldn't do that. But I'm interested in, uh, in asking uh, a couple of questions. You know, I'm, I'm, very, I'm very taken by expertise and consultancy, but more about the EX. X, I like in Armani, EX exchange. Is it a brand? Uh, is it a name? Is it a process? You know, what is being exchanged? What is the result of that exchange? You know, is it cultural exchange, an economic exchange, a political exchange? Is it a symmetric exchange? Is it an exchange between the consultant firm, usually from the West, with a kind of expertise that is defined by whom? Who defines that? Uh, is the consultant defining what the consultant needs to do? In other words, how are the problems identified that the consultant needs to address? What are the paradigms that are being created? And what is the exchange that is taking place between the consultant and the consultee? I guess it's the, I'm not sure, as you can tell, this English is not my first language and never will be as much as I may try. Uh, <coughs> so I'm interested in, in trying to analyze what is left behind when the consultant leaves, you know, how is the culture uh, redefined? Uh, is this a sign of, you know, can we read, uh, how can we analyze, can we in a way dissect the process of consultancy and expertise? That what values, you know, how do we value that expertise? How is it delivered? How is it exchanged? How is it uh, rooted and becomes part of that new reality? How it stops being Western and becomes uh, something else, or does it, and it, what, is the, what is the result of that uh, uh, process? I would put forward that it has, and I think in that, in that sense there is a bit of a Freudian unconscious here, you know, affected uh, what has happened, the incredible amount of investment, opportunities, and experimentation that is taking place in the Middle East. Uh, sometimes we see it as a, as a playground, sometimes we see it uh, as a challenge, but um, I, I, I would put forward that in any case it has radically transformed what we understand as architecture and urbanism, the possibilities of it and the mechanism by which we think of it. It would be impossible uh, for it to be otherwise. Uh, so these are questions that I very much look forward to discuss today, but I'm really open to any kind of discussion because I know uh, we have two uh, uh, incredible speakers today. We have Professor Nasser later on, and we have a second round of discussions tomorrow. Uh, so I wanted to, first of all, recognize and thank again Abdul, Abdurrahman, is that close enough? Uh, close. He's very generous to me. Uh, and Munira. But also, I uh, want to thank a number of people that have been involved. First of all, the students. This is a student-led symposium, and, and clearly something we're very proud of, uh, their ability to put together something like this. Uh, the support of uh, Interim Dean Professor Randall Corman, and the French uh, on the school lecture series has made this really an incredible uh, effort uh, and support, not only in terms of logistics and money, but really support, support. Uh, Jim Connors of the Office of Advancement of the University, the Society of Multicultural Architects and Designers, the Architectural Student Association, Al Saif Engineering Contracting Company as sponsors, Suede and Suede also sponsoring, and of course the School of Architecture with the lecture series, and also to our speakers for being here on a very tight schedule and be willing to share with us. We have this afternoon two uh, speakers uh, that I'm very happy to see here, and I just need to get my notes. I lost your biography. <laughs> I just found it again. Uh, we have, I'm going to introduce both of them, and then we're going to have the presentations followed by a short discussion. We will have a break then. And then the, the keynote speaker after that, that uh, Professor Jonathan Solomon will be introducing. 
Uh, Hanin Lars and Architects uh, has a long history uh, as an office starting back in the 50s, I believe. Uh, he worked with Al Jacobsen, who is one of my heroes. Um, and at some point in his career, he decided to democratize the office and share it, uh, actually spread the shares with uh, his employees. So now he's been run by a number of people uh, with different locations. And I was trying to track the locations from Riyadh, of course, Copenhagen, Munich, Oslo, Turkey. Am I missing? <laughs> so when Sonia said that we should, uh, I should let her know any time that I'm close to an office, I said, well, that's very easy because they are all over the world. So that should be. Uh, Sonia is a graduate from the Copenhagen uh, Art uh, Academy. She works, uh, she's the head of master planning and senior urban planner at the Henning Larsen Architects. She specializes in designing large-scale master plan and has vast experience in developing master plan projects in different cultural contexts. And I'm quite intrigued by the, the project that she has been engaged with because they, again, span quite a bit of uh, geography from Riyadh to Nigeria to Denmark to Saudi Arabia to Syria and the United Arab Emirates. So, uh, And she's basically in charge of the financial district project in Riyadh, which is uh, an incredibly uh, complex and demanding project. And a project that, as you may know, is part of a policy uh, in Saudi Arabia, uh, a policy that emanates from the a scenario of what happens when oil runs out, either because the, the source itself runs out or because uh, it is replaced as a source of energy. So the economic diversification is one of the top priorities for, uh, for the kingdom. And this project plays a major role together with five uh, new towns that are being built in, in Saudi Arabia. Uh, our friend Todd Rees visiting from Yale. Uh, right now he lives, uh, I believe you live in Amsterdam, you're based in Amsterdam, but current, uh, currently a visiting professor in urbanism at Yale. Uh, last. Uh, the he's an editor of uh, Almanac, which is one of, you know, probably the most serious, at least in my uh, world, research on this process of uh, developing in the Middle East. Uh, editor of the volume of Almanac, work with Amo and Oma. I was saying that I, I saw him uh, in the middle of a very interesting exchange of the role of books and architecture at the crossroads of production of ideas between Mark Wigley and Rem Koolhaas, um, and I loved it. I recommend that video to anybody because uh, it speaks bound bundles about uh, a current uh, architectural mm, debate. Uh, uh, I'm going to, to read something I don't normally do, but I think uh, the description of, of his work is better read. Uh, he's an architect, researcher, and writer, currently focusing on the cities of the Gulf region from both historical and contemporary perspective. He's the ed editor of Almanac, Gulf Continued, which analyzes the recent development of cities in Saudi Arabia, Kuwait, Qatar, Bahrain, and the United Arab Emirates. He has recently been appointed the Daniel Rose Visiting Assistant Professor in Urbanism at Yale School of Architecture. He's also the academic writing editor for Portal 9, a Be Beirut-based journal focused on cities in the Arab countries. And at present, he's completing the book about Dubai's early modernization, how that era's conviction determined the city we know today. Uh, very, I'm, very, I'm very happy and very proud to have you both as our guests. Thank you again, and please welcome Sonia and Todd. <laughs> Working? Yep. Okay. Can you hear me? No. So, 
Can you hear me? Okay. Yeah, my name is Sonia and I'm from the Henning Lassen office that you just heard. Is it Thank you. Okay. Is it better? Yes. Okay. I want to go through um, the project that um, we have just been introduced to called uh, King Abdullah Financial District. This is a picture from the project. First, I just want to give a short presentation of the office. I'm based in Copenhagen mainly. I travel um, quite a lot and, and used to travel a lot to Saudi Arabia as well. I've been there for living a short period as well. Um, as we were told, uh, the office is founded by the Professor Henning Larsen. Henning Larsen is um, unfortunately not that much in the office anymore. Uh, um, he has reached 85 years now. Um, he was founded in 19, uh, 1959 and is today led by, fe um, fi by five partners and, uh, and different uh, associated partners. We are based all over the world. Um, we're working within the office today around 190 um, designers and architects. Um, we're working within the office. Um, we today work like both with different foreign cultures so on, but we're also working in more than 15 countries. So we are quite global compared to a normal um, Danish uh, office, you could say. Um, our areas of work is of course the master planning, different cultural environments, learning and research environments, um, commercial headquarters, uh, healthcare faci facilities and residential communities. And these pictures are taken from the first one is from the opera of uh, Copenhagen. The second one is the foreign ministry of um, uh, in, in Riyadh. Um, what has um, been our approach and, and vision, and also Henning Larsen's approach and vision, um, has been of course developed by time. But, but what we today work about is that <coughs> we are very driven by the, the context that we work in. We're driven by the eye level design, meaning that we are working for the people. So when we do stuff, we do it at ground level and we're using our eyes and our skin to feel how that, that space should actually be. Um, then we have a knowledge-based design, meaning that we use the um, research that we do within the office as, for example, uh, sustainability research. We use that um, as an as a, um, approach and, and, and one of our visions. Meaning that in relation to especially this project, um, we are trying to enhance the quality of the, of the urban experience. We want to give something back to the city and to the citizens. We want to offer an added value also when we have left being like a, an architect in a foreign country. <coughs> we want to um, foster a sense of community, meaning that we want to have people to meet. We want to create communicate, communicating spaces. So instead of not seeing what you're actually passing by, you should be aware of the buildings that you're actually passing by. We use integrated sustainable um, design. Uh, we have um, last year reduced some of our buildings with um, energy consumption up to 75%. Um, this is only by um, using the, the, the geometry and the context. So this is without adding um, any or producing any local energy. So normally when we, when we draw a building, we are at this level. We start with optimizing, then we reduce by components and installations. And then as an extra bonus, we start to produce local energy. This is the project that I'm talking about and that I have been involved in since yeah, the first interview, King Abdullah Financial District. Um, what can you say? It's 160 hectares. Hectares. Um, when we started, 
it looked like desert. This is how more or less the rest of Riyadh looked at the time. Um, and we should make a financial district and we should make five million square meters. Um, our client was a public pension agency and a capital market authority. So it was both private but also public. It was an investment. It was a, it was a you could say, a city decision. Um, the client had an advisor called DTZ, with, which made like the feasibility study of the city. Um, and the project was proved and blessed by the king. This is a very important thing because it also means that it goes out to the people of the country. <clears throat> um, how we started the project was that we, we were invited because of that ministry. Um, we started um, with 10 different participants in, the in, in an international uh, competition, but it wasn't a design competition, this was an interview competition. They selected five, and then they selected two, and we were at that time competing with Gensler. And in 2006, we were selected without drawing anything. We were only selected by our um, approach to design. So to get all started, and before we even started designing, we had to find a vision um, together with the client. And this, I think, has been one of the most important steps in this project that everybody agreed before actually started drawing. So a clear identity, state of the art, sustainable landmark, and a destination for the citizens of Riyadh, and that, that there should be easy access meaning that this area should in Riyadh be for everybody. And this is, in my opinion, and correct me if I'm wrong, this is quite new um, compared to the city of Riyadh. So trying to find our, you could say, common language with the client and with the country and with the city, um, we, we, we did that, we locally, we tried to find some references that we could agree upon. And then globally, we made several um, study tours around the world to find out what, what, what is this sense of what, what city is this? And I mean, compared to the scale, five million square meters, we haven't done in the office five million square meters before. This was a really big project to us as well, uh, which, it all, which was the same for the client. So we had to find a way of understanding each other and the scale. So traveling around the world, trying to find streetscapes that would fit with the amount of floors of the buildings, um, trying to find uh, ways of moving around, um, what should it be like uh, compared to the transportation. One thing that we really wanted to have in the area was that we wanted to use the history we wanted to use the context because this is actually also the context in some areas today. You can see the future here. This is a tower in the center and, and quite close to our area. Not one of our towers, you could say. Um, but this is an ancient city of, uh, of Riyadh. And we wanted to use the knowledge that was used at that time. You know you have 50 degrees Celsius um, in some days. You have the sun very high and you want to actually only walk in shaded areas. You want the wind to be broken by the building so that in summer times you have really, really hot winds. As a, it feels like a hair dryer actually. It dries out the, um, the, 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 the skin and it, it actually starts to burn really, really fast. So we wanted to find some of these designs that they have used for several years that was actually built in the history. And we took those things and then we actually transferred it into a future or a, a, uh, a city that, that could um, have like several floors or could even have lanes for driving into floors and so on. But we took, we wanted to use the shading, we wanted to use um, the, the way of breaking the wind but just in another scale. And then, of course, create spaces for people walking was also 
quite new thing at this time in, in Riyadh. You have it in the ancient history, but more or less you don't have it in the rest of the city. So overall to explain the master plan, um, the facts of, this, of the area is that we have 160 hectares, 5 million square meters, 60,000 parking spaces, and still we, we actually keep the area with a public realm more than 30%. And that's what makes this area different from the rest of the city, because we're actually enhancing people to stay outside in public spaces. Further, it contains a wadi. A wadi is <coughs> a lower area um, in the desert. This is where you have the water. Earlier you had the water collecting here. This is a green space. Um, we have what we call a financial plaza, public <coughs> attractors, monorail and skywalks. So these things, except from the wadi, are actually quite new to the city. This is a picture from the wadi that we did in 2006. The wadi is all the green stuff that you have here. This is what is connecting the city. This is what should be the, dis uh, the, the, the area where you can actually, as a citizen of Riyadh, you would go here on Sundays or when you're off. This is an area where you have shops. Um, this is lowered from the street. This also means that it will be secure to, to walk around here. This is what connects all the cultural points. This is where you should hang out. Um, we have the financial plaza, and the financial pl plaza is an area where um, the, the largest banks of Saudi Arabia, the pension funds and so, they would have their main uh, headquarters here. There's a high secure area. And um, this is um, a picture from 2009, I think. Um, then we have the public attractors, and that can be anything, but those are what is here drawing as the blue buildings. Those are buildings that are special within the area, and where you have the, the public spaces surrounding those um, public attractors. This is also where you can transfer from, for example, the monorail. You can have, there's a station here, so you can get off, and then you can have, this is a financial academy, for example and then you can connect directly to the wadi, make a tour around, go with the monorail again. So here we see the monorail. Um, this was another thing that was very early um, in, in the project, and this was new to, to Riyadh, because at this time, when we started up, there was no public transportation except from buses. Um, so this was quite new, that you could actually start to use public transportation. For us, it was it was different because we, we, we were used to use trains, metros, buses, blah, blah, blah. But here, this is new, so that was really good. And one of the main reasons was that if you take in that many cars to serve five million square meters, then <laughs> you will queue up like miles and miles away. So we needed this. Then we have the skywalks. And the skywalks, we introduced that because that um, to walk around in, in Riyadh is at at least three months of the year, almost impossible. Um, so we wanted people to walk and enhance the walking, but we cannot force people to stay outside in the middle of the desert. So what we did was that we would temporate those uh, skywalks to have people walking from one building to another. All buildings are connected with this system. So you can actually walk above ground all over the area. It connects to the monorail, it connects to the um, cultural attractors, and of course it, it connects through the buildings to the wadi. This is how we see the wadi, or at the time we did. Um, we were very much into make, creating this area for people living in Riyadh, and that was a very important thing for us, that it shouldn't be for some people, it should be for everyone. Um, we had a, um, our design parameters, and this was made, uh, based upon uh, some research that we did about the, um, the area here, especially in relation to the temperature there and the, and the wind. And the wind, normally, the really, really strong and hot winds, which is the one that burns your skin, comes from the south. And the more cool ones, they come from the north at nighttime. 
So this was one thing that we wanted. We wanted to build a wall around the area to leave out the, the really strong hot winds and then at night time bring in the cold winds to cool down the area during night time. And we used that, we used that as a parameter of the design to control the cold winds. We wanted to have them into the wadi area. So by using the buildings to make the wind come into the wadi and break it where, we, where it wasn't necessary. And then of course we wanted most people to have a view. That is why that we have a center which has really, really tall buildings around the financial plaza and then lowers down. And that is also the way of controlling the wind. So how do we transfer all the knowledge that we have got during the design period, which was about a year? Um, we, together with the client, of course, developed um, urban design guidelines in relation to how do we actually maintain this approach and, and vision of ours. And this was done to actually take each plot of the total area, decide the height, decide what, where to build to, what corner to, to meet, and how tall, of course. Where can you create an open space? Um, because we didn't want to have the, the outdoor spaces to be um, too open. We wanted to create a dense city because the Riyadh is today, or was at, at least at the time, it was more or less all, of, all over the city, it was about two or three floors. So we wanted to create a real city space. Um, so we have drawn the height and the, uh, decided the, the size of the square meters in the building um, in an urban design guidelines. Then we have done like an area regulations, uh, meaning that we are trying to regulate each, each area. The total site is divided into seven different areas. Uh, so each area should at least consist of a, um, a, a monorail station, for example, a, an outdoor space as a plaza, and so on and so on. Then we have some sustainability regulation, meaning that uh, you're not, you cannot build in, for example, um, a facade that, that uh, is too uh, reflecting the sunlight too much because then the neighbor building will have to screen. So we have decided the colors and the materials and uh, what kind of solar screen that you can actually use to lower the energy uh, use of the building. And this was done in a very early phase because <coughs> because as we have also heard that, that there is a time after the oil. So hopefully um, at the moment they are very much into the sustainability um, because that you can actually lower the, 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 um, the cost of the building with, with these actually quite simple regulations. Then there is uh, public realm regulations, meaning that we have described what we want to have in the public outdoor spaces decided how wide the street should be, what kind of street furniture, where should we have a palm tree, where should we not have a palm tree, where could we cross the street and so on. Um, and then of course there's the architectural regulations and again that leads to the sustainable, sustainability regulations of um, how transparent can your facade be, um, what color can it be, uh, and all these kind of things. What can you put on your roof? Because there's so many uh, buildings that are overlooking the other buildings, then you won't have uh, different kind of antennas and, and so on on the top. So how can we regulate all these things? Sorry? Yeah. Um, then furthermore, we were a part of the review panel afterwards, after the design or after the master plan. Um, and here we, um, we help the client with cho choosing, choosing the, the, the coming architects. And that was done in international competition especially. Today, these are all the different, actually there is more, but these are the different uh, um, companies represented in the area. So we are still there. Um, PPA, the public pa pension agency, CMA. Hill is a, uh, an American company, took over the project man management of the area, and then several um, international architects are represented. This is uh, the financial plaza, and this is where we are still um, working in the area also. It's under construction today, financial plaza, the main plaza of the area. 
Um, the plaza is in two floors and we wanted to, to give it a very special identity with these sh huge uh, shading palm trees leaves, you could almost say. We have drawn the, the skywalk systems. We have just got, uh, received a mock-up in one-to-one. -one. This is the inside. We are involved in a project called Crystal Towers, which is two buildings within the area. And Project Villas in the Sky, a high-rise building, a mostly residential building. A children's interactive museum as one of those cultural attractors. And this is how it looks today, or a couple of weeks ago at least. Thank you very much. Can you hear me? Is it working? Good. Good afternoon. Uh, first, I'd really like to give a special thanks to Abdul Rahman and Munira uh, for, for putting this together. I really admire kind of what you've done uh, and, and kind of bringing a topic that's not so easily found in the US. Uh, so uh, this is kind of a homecoming um, few months for me. And it's really warm to see a topic that I've been interested also being here as well. Uh, in addition, thank you, Professor Sunin, for kind of supporting their effort. I think it's really spectacular that a university allows students to take initiatives and, and bring uh, people together. Um, so, and of course, to the team that supported um, everyone uh, so that we could be here. So uh, once again, thank you. Um, as I said, I, I appreciate this topic. Uh, and I uh, am uh, one who will say that I really appreciate the, the, the title, Expertise Exposed. Uh, it really gets at the heart of, of, of a particular interest of mine. If only I had thought of this term first, I might have to pay uh, Munira and Abdul Rahman uh, for the, the, the ability to use it in the future, um, unless they've copyrighted it. Um, I guess one of the main reasons why I like uh, this term, especially uh, in relation uh, to, to kind of discovering something about this region is that it goes further uh, in the kind of considerization, uh, sorry, consideration of urbanization in the Gulf. And it begins to start uh, to suggest that we, we need to look beyond just kind of projects and, and results of urbanization, but actually look at the influences upon them, namely the people who bear um, uh, the expertise. So while this image uh, might be a bit simplistic in suggesting the kind of helicoptering in of expertise, of professionalism, of let's say even kind of uh, material, materialistic comfort, um, it does start to suggest that we do need a kind of careful consideration of the provenance uh, the, and the translation of kind of a global exchange of ideas on a global market. And I don't mean to, to suggest or to assume that this kind of condition of a global exchange continuously happening in the Gulf should be a natural state. In my conversations with Munira and with Abdul, we've talked about actually the kind of the need, and this has been a discussion uh, for, you know, for the last 80 years, of how actually this can become say, a more localized, or at least having a more local uh, conversation about these topics. But nevertheless, we're talking about cities in the Gulf. And I'll help with a map in a moment, where it's the norm that these cities have at least an 80% population that comes from somewhere else. 
uh, which uh, gets at the question, uh, gets at the assumption that when you're talking about the Gulf, you're talking about everywhere else. Just a, a quick moment about myself. I'm an architect, but I haven't done a lot as an architect um, in the Gulf. I, I, I consider myself a kind of critical uh, observer of urbanization and architectural production um, in cities like Dubai, Doha, and Riyadh, uh, which I will get into a little bit today. Um, and this year is actually a, a, a kind of new uh, challenge for me, was I'm actually taking these ideas for the first time to the classroom. Uh, Yale School of Architecture brought me in, I believe, to kind of help pump up a non-Western um, uh, component to that infinite uh, fight for accreditation. Um, but I, I kind of see, I, I was very upfront with my colleagues, but also with my students, that this is no kind of, kind of traditional regional studies course. We're not uh, looking at a region. Uh, it's very clear up front with my students that it uh, is the assumption of, of a very quick dissolution of the difference between here and there, because we are very much here everywhere. Uh, to begin with, I think a fair understanding of the region's relationship with modernization and urbanization, you have to reach back actually to the 19th century. Uh, this is a picture from the very early 20th century, but it comes from a moment when the British government was all uh, but a colonizer in name in most of the region we know as, uh, as the Gulf Coast. Uh, while it might not have been colonialism, it certainly was a, a policy of cordon and control, that if modernization wasn't going to come from the British, it certainly wasn't going to come from anywhere else. And when it was to come, it would be on the terms of the British, at least for the beginning. And this was kind of a, a starting point for a project I've been working with since 2006 called Almanach. Um, Almanach is a term we took, um, uh, an Arabic word that can, can translate to something like climate. Uh, climate being something very physical, but also can take on uh, more kind of metaphorical reasons about climate as well. Of course, it also has a relationship to a word in other languages, Almanach, a book of facts and figures. And the firm that I worked for, OMA, is very well known for making books of facts and figures. Uh, these are some of the cities that we looked at uh, in, the, um, in the process of, of making both of these books. The first one came out in 2007. Um, it came out at the kind of hottest moment of a, of a building boom happening in the Gulf. The second book came out in 2010 at perhaps the chilliest moment of a global financial crisis. And both of these projects, I think, enabled us to, to consider the, the, the role of the architect in the process of urbanization. While it might have been focused on the region, it certainly can be kind of extended to elsewhere. Um, and not just uh, architects, but also kind of consultants in general. Uh, architects as a kind of whole friendly family of um, consultants. My own personal work is looking at the modernization specifically of Dubai uh, in the 1960s and 70s, which were actually the true heady uh, years of, of development, uh, where it was really about large-scale uh, insertion and intervention with uh, urbanization infrastructure uh, into the uh, creation of a modern city. Before I go further, there are, there are some misconceptions about the region that I'd like to address. Uh, and this is perhaps one of the most irritating, represented uh, by the former mayor of London. Uh, he actually makes explicit something that's often uh, made implicit in kind of architecture, an architect's fantasy of, of working in the Gulf, namely this notion of tabula rasa. Um, I think one of the, the kind of assumptions uh, that we wanted to address was the notion that there's always context, that architectural context might be something you don't necessarily have, but there are, in fact, more powerful forms of context, social, cultural, and, of course, optimistic. But nevertheless, there's been this kind of uh, mystical aesthetic fascination uh, with insertion and, and unhindered change. And kind of bouncing onto this idea of unhindered change, 
has been this irritatingly repeated uh, imagery of a city rising from the sands. This is just a very quick um, roundup of some of the uses of, of this term in, in popular media. But the very notion that a city could actually rise from the sand is something that is ob obviously false. Um, and part of my work, and perhaps also with Almanach, is the kind of consideration that while modernization might go back arguably uh, 80 years throughout the region, and maybe even more, we can even start to begin to put together within that amount of time a, a kind of lineage of consultancy uh, that one is building on, on top of the, the other. Of course, Patrick Abercrombie's new town ambitions in London are directly translated into our dear Kuwait city. Uh, you see it even today. Um, and, and also that modernization doesn't just happen, it, it actually has its stages of, of very simple beginnings. Uh, this is Sheikh Rashid of Dubai um, meeting his first road packer, which is essentially one of the uh, first implementations of modernization, literally just the hardening of sand uh, to enable cars to move through. This is even before tarmac. And then, of course, is the whole kind of aesthetic of modernization and even the relationship that a, a, a citizen or a, a resident of a city uh, begins to develop with, um, with a city, uh, namely here, a hospital. Kind of what, what are the assumptions uh, that a, a city should have? And this is, of course, made by an architect. And then how those things are, of course, translated into the ways we work. Uh, uh, sorry, the ways we live, the translation of building materials and also processes that do have to uh, adjust, if they are coming from somewhere else, to a different kind of climate. This is one of my favorite finds in a mid-1970s RIBA journal, where a kind of traditional town planner from Britain is seeing the writing on the wall, namely the Bechtels coming to town. At the, of course, we all know now who Bechtel is, but this is certainly a kind of moment when the, the, the British town planner uh, perhaps characterized in a way as, as being about carefulness, of slowness, is suddenly being confronted with American go-getterism, the brawny, marble man of an engineer, uh, who would, of course, lead the way in the kind of next stages of Saudi's modernization through the industrial cities. Even in this process, you see a, a, an oversimplification of a kind of towning, uh, town planning process that becomes kind of like a, a um, as if planning is, uh, a, uh, is a game of common sense, of, of, of immediate notions of dispersal and distribution, so that the, what we know as the neighborhood unit is kind of reduced uh, to something uh, that anyone can read. The next quick um, moment of, let's say, misconception is that architecture now and development uh, and urban planning now in the Gulf is all about star architecture. This is perhaps the, the greatest moment of that, uh, and perhaps even the end game of star architecture uh, in the Gulf, that being Saadiyat Island in Abu Dhabi. Uh, which began with at least five star architects being given prize locations on a new development, but now has perhaps been reduced to three. Jean Nouvel with the Louvre Museum, Gary with the Guggenheim, and Norman Foster with the Sheikh Zayed Museum. But I, I would beg you to kind of reconsider if this is, is uh, this your assumption of what architecture is in the Gulf because it's very much more about this, at least part of it. This is a group of just some of the architectural firms uh, producing architecture in the Gulf. We call them the virtually unknowns in Almanach. These are, these are firms that uh, quickly grew through the 2000s uh, in cities like Beirut and Cairo, uh, in Dubai and Abu Dhabi, uh, to, to kind of really lead the way in, in architectural production and, of course, uh, real estate speculation. Beyond the virtually unknowns is, of course, this kind of alphabet soup of, of, 
of architecture firms that we've all known as kind of being interchangeable, buying out one another, and responding to global capital production. If you do look at global capital production, you will note that construction makes a somewhat considerable component of industrial sector, but architecture is but a mere sliver of this. Of course, this has implications. We've all heard by now of ACOM. ACOM is a firm that perhaps we as architects know as a, a kind of globalizing firm that is simply buying up architecture firms. However, it's much more than just buying up architecture firms. Of 50,000 people who work at ACOM, last I counted, 3% are architects. So what we learn from stories of, of architecture firms like ACOM is that essentially we're looking at if you want to do architecture, you have to be everything but an architecture firm. Another firm, Atkins out of uh, the UK, architecture is but a mere subcategory of one of many categories um, of a global business. And then if you look at the world's largest architecture and engineering firms, where do you find them? In the world's most mature real estate markets. So, Logical thinking would make you see that uh, in order to sustain a company's growth, growth, you have to look elsewhere. There are parts of the world that are uh, uh, experiencing major population booms, but here I would take us to three cities, Riyadh, Doha, and Abu Dhabi. Riyadh we heard about earlier today, and it's a particular um, city, especially in this roundup, mainly because it actually has a population um, dilemma. By 2020, the population of Riyadh will have doubled in 10 years. And not only that, uh, the city actually has, by 2020, more than 60% of the city uh, will be under the age of 30. That has major implications in terms of, um, of, of development. Here's a picture of, of Riyadh. Um, the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia actually has a very major uh, dilemma at hand. Uh, this was a, a kind of a fact that was in the press, a lot of financial press, uh, several years ago. Obviously, we haven't heard about the 1.5 million, 1 million houses uh, being developed in time. But nevertheless, uh, it kind of represents a real demographic need um, for development. However, it's not this demographic need that is driving development uh, in the Gulf, uh, sorry, in Riyadh. It's not driving uh, foreign direct investment. It's not attracting the, uh, the, the kind of professional availability of cons consultants. It's actually the state's ability to back up any sort of overdevelopment or any kind of speculative failure. That is also the same with Doha. When, uh, when Dubai started to kind of uh, flounder in 2008, Doha was on the rise as a kind of good news story to foil, as a foil to the bad news story of what's going on in Doha. Um, but again, the issue here is not that Doha actually has a demographic issue to confront, it's merely that Doha has the coffers um, to, to back up any sort of foreign investment. I'd like to look at three uh, projects and, and kind of look at their um, uh, similarities. This one, of course, uh, we've heard from Sonia um, today, the King Abdullah Financial District in Riyadh, Mastar City in Abu Dhabi, which probably most of you uh, know of because it was designed by uh, Norman Foster's firm. And then there's Mishera, uh, a project in Doha, uh, designed by ACOM with the help of others, including Alice and Morrison. And I, saw, I see these, whereas Saadiyat Island actually, I think, is a, a pre-crisis example uh, of development. These three, to me, even though uh, I would say all of them began uh, before the crisis, really represent a post-crisis Gulf development. Um, and they also uh, represent, as uh, Professor Sanin mentioned, um, evidence of, of trying to develop an economy that's no longer reliant 
on hydrocarbons. Um, if my earlier comments about the diminishing efforts or, or, or presence of architecture upset you, I think perhaps here we see architecture certainly on the rise. Uh, that's because that these three projects, I would argue, are not about urbanism. They're simply about the multiplication of architecture. They're more about urbaneness than urbanism. And I, I, I put this forward uh, for several reasons. One, as you can see, each of them is, is distinctly demarcated from their surroundings. King Abdullah Financial District by a highway. Uh, Mastar, which is actually uh, set kind of maybe uh, 20, 30 minutes outside of downtown Abu Dhabi. And Mesherab, uh, while being situated uh, in the uh, old heart of the city of Doha, as you can see, is um, clearly demarcated uh, from the rest of the city. It's also, at, at parts, I believe, going to be actually raised above, um, uh, above the, the city's ground level because of underground parking. Um, and I think this kind of, uh, not necessarily compactness, but this kind of delineation of, of, uh, of development uh, comes at a, as a kind of system of control, a control of not only kind of architectural development, uh, but also kind of controlling a message toward the outside world. Once again, they're, they're projecting a sense of urbaneness. And there are also a moment where the cities are actually able to, um, to, to invest in consultancy that allows them to kind of trump the, the criticism being directed them uh, in previous errors. So while you look at these projects and you hear them described as new, as urban, and as sustainable, I would beg you to look at them in a kind of continuation of a lineage of consultancy, somewhat like what I was trying to show you um, at the beginning. I think it's necessary that as we go on that we kind of forget notions of newness and the ends of errors, but actually start to see development uh, in the Gulf as something of a continuum. These, again, aren't places that are rising from the sands. There are places that are responding not only to a uh, global context, but also a kind of constant cycle of errors and corrections. Um, the, the, even the kind of the profession of architecture or the profession of being a consultant is about putting forward projects that actually have error embedded in them. There's actually a need to put the error in them so that there's a, a potential to come back and consult more. Um, I also would like to make a, a, a point about Mesherab. Uh, all three of these projects uh, see themselves as being sustainable. Mesherab will actually have more LEED certified platinum buildings than most American cities have um, today. Uh, that's quite remarkable. And that's also very good evidence of kind of trumping the system, of actually saying, OK, if it's about a checklist, we'll check everything off and to the point that there's actually nothing more to argue. The point is, uh, in, in, in some of these ways, that consultants are able to give you the criteria which need to be met. As long as you're, they're met, you're doing fine. I'm going to maybe need two. Uh, this is a picture I took during the uh, demolition of the area around uh, Mesherab uh, in Doha. And I think it re reminds, uh, it is remarkable for me because it really represents a kind of changing notion of what actual modernization, global engagement means to a city or to a leaders of the city of Doha. Uh, that actually something has to come down in order for the new to come up. So once again, this isn't about rising from the sand, it's about revision. We also start to see kind of the, the, the kind of uh, evolving language of architecture, this kind of use of a um, like light that we often see in photographs of, of souks, especially, um, Professor Robert, I wanted to ask you, it's Damascus has these kind of, um, kind of cascading light into spaces that, that become the kind of the, the norm of kind of as if a kind of um, 
uh, that this is a kind of language of being able to be outside. So that sustainability isn't about, about less, but actually more architectural production. That architecture is actually supposed to show us that we can be, uh, that architectural production can actually make our climate more docile. I will close up um, with, I guess, once again making the point, um, yeah, this is just uh, coverage of the uh, Machera project in the Financial Times, um, which really represented to me a, a kind of a, a search for global approbation in these projects, uh, which has actually always been part of the game in the Gulf. At first, uh, it was seen as too backward, then too slow, and then too fast. And now suddenly, it seems that it's about being just right. But it's only just right just for now. Thanks. So I'd like to invite Professor Sinin and uh, Todd and Sonia for uh, a quick uh, panel discussion. And we opened this for a Q&A. We started uh, 15 minutes late, but I believe we do have a little bit of time. And we'll take about a 15 minutes break before we start uh, the next session and give some time to prepare the next presentation. Thank you. Uh, Maybe turn off the. Oh. Well, it's either very easy to be a moderator today or very, very difficult. <laughs> uh, I think Todd and Sonia had set up a stage of uh, dialectics, would be probably a mild uh, word to say. Uh, I was intrigued by this notion of the rising the cities from the sand. Because uh, one of the things that I found, and, and I think Sonia also described it that way, that most uh, projects I've seen done in the Gulf are described as contextual when they deal with heat and wind. Uh, and that's the sort of the, the extent of the historic. So for me, there, there, is, a, there is a sort of uh, reduction of context to something that is limited. Um, I'm sure there is more than that, but I think it would be interesting to see how our, you know, these process by which expertise is, expo is exported, not exposed, but exported, right, arriving in a place with very limited knowledge then grabs onto the most self-evident things, which is heat and, and wind. And, uh, and so when, when you describe the city as a desert, uh, 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 I've been working with Abdurrahman uh, for a while, and I know you know Riyadh has an incredibly complex and long history, and you know both socially and so on and so forth. And I think that does for me does raise a series of questions, which are, are to be fair not always the domain of the architect. Yeah, you don't always have the tools or the me or the means to control the fact that you may ha have been given a highway as a limit, right? That, that's not what, not necessarily what the architect do, but it does raise questions because I'm sure that it has to be inscribed in the largest phenomenon of consultancy because I'm sure there's another consultancy firm somewhere in there that is describing the infrastructure and defining the need for this to be secure and isolated from the city. Um, so there's a series of questions that I'm just expanding maybe what Todd was asking, but I also wanted to ask Todd uh, that your description is very much from the outside in, you know, that the role of the consultant, the way that it constructs itself and its relation or the relation to. Uh, but I'm very intrigued of what's happening on the ground, you know, not, not about the invisible uh, consultants, but the invisible Arab, <laughs> you know, the, the migrant workers, the the complexity of, of a society that is going through political upheaval, that is going through uh, radical changes and so on. And so I, I wonder how, if you could also span on how on the ground things are changing and being either filter uh, whether this, the effect of consultancy is a change of a to a culture of extreme consumption or are there other dynamics at play in, in this arrival on the helicopter in of consultancy, which basically means vision, lifestyle, and so on. 
Yes, I don't know. Uh, th that's that's a tough question. Um, that's why you have to be <laughs> I, I think one of the, I guess one of my points I was trying to make is that there is, um, when you look at, uh, I guess, first of all, it's very different in different parts of the Gulf. I think, for instance, the, the, the experience in Riyadh is very different than Dubai and, and then also Doha. Uh, so it's very difficult to generalize everything at once. I guess I'll, I'll, I'll look specifically to answer the question, uh, to look at a place like Doha, um, which, um, you know, Meshera project is being funded by the Qatar Foundation, which is funded by the Qatar Investment Authority, which is a sovereign wealth fund. Um, so that's, but it's actually been built as, as a company uh, to be a developer, but then also to be a, a, a landlord. So in, in fact, in the end, Meshera will be a project um, where the city, the state is your landlord. Um, whether you're um, a Qatari or whether you're an expat living for two years in, the, in Doha. Um, I think, you know, my point is that if you look at kind of the, the history of kind of the ideas that get implemented, the ideas that are good, and then suddenly the next consultant comes in and tells you that they're, you know, horrific. You know, there's, a, there's someone who told them that it was uh, the client that it was good in the first place, and there were reasons for it being there. Um, and, and so there's a kind of style that happens. And I think what Meshera represents is, once again, that, that kind of very fashionable ideas. No matter what you think of kind of sustainable development, kind of as a, as a kind of ethical need of our global society. That, that's not really what I'm interested in here. Um, but there's definitely elements of profit uh, in the, the message of sustainability. But there's also a clear message of, of being legitimate. And I think that the, the, the process, whether you're a parastatal uh, developer in Dubai or you're a government agency in Riyadh, modernization is being used as a kind of uh, effort of autonomy, but also global legitimacy. Um, yeah, of course, there is um, a few things that are given when you start up a project like this. And of course, it will uh, affect whatever that you do. Um, and you could also discuss whether that you could come from Copenhagen, uh, which is about the same size as the entire city here that we have drawn, and tell what, what you should do. But uh, what I think is important is that you, of course, always have a client, and there's always, it's always a business, so of course you should have, or you should at least get some money to do it, uh, for it, or for doing it. Um, but of course, the values that we have put into this project are values that we in our world think is really important. And I mean, in terms of sustainability, then um, Riach has a total wrong position. It's in the middle of the desert. They don't have any water at all. So I mean, that, that's, I think, is a, mm, it's difficult to discuss in that way. But, but what I think is really important is that when we were, um, after thousands of interviews and we were chosen to do the project, um, was on the background that, that what we felt was that Riyadh wanted to change. And I, I know and I, I, I love the history of, the, of Riyadh and I love the old city. Um, but as, as in many other cities, the, the old city has become like the museum of, of uh, the area. Um, and what we found out after being there sometimes was that there was a lack of areas where uh, the citizens could stay outside except of the parking spaces where they actually have their picnics. So that was one thing that we really wanted to create. We wanted to create spaces for the citizens of the city. We wanted to get them out of the four walls surrounding their um, two-floor high villas. Um, 
and of course uh, we have the highway surrounding it that we couldn't delete. Um, but uh, you could also say that that was just an extra challenge and, and, and what I think is really important is that when we started in the area we didn't know much about the culture so we for example started with suggesting a um, swimming pool which is um, totally um, weird to do in that part of the country because that women especially don't show themselves without um, scarf and so. So um, that was the first uh, meeting with another culture. Um, but, but on the other hand, then we had to transfer those things into a common language and, and, um, and something that we really wanted to do in the area. So you could say that or, uh, it's, it, somehow it's easy to criticize these huge projects. But from my point of view, I see it as a development of not only Riyadh, but also Saudi Arabia. They are reaching for, for the next generation to, to, to grow up. And, mm -hmm. and as you can see, Abdullah, he's here today. So <laughs> he is also reaching out for another country and taking his knowledge back to the Saudi Arabia. So I think it is for the new generation, no doubt about it. I think if I may just have a, one follow-up question, because I'm, I'm, you know, of course the point here is not to put on, on trial the project or, or anything, but rather to, uh, to understand somebody that who's, that's so embedded in the, in the process, you know, of exp you know, so we're trying to understand what is involved I in that. And I'm always uh, I'm kind of fascinated by the fact that of this cycle of the flow of ideas where, you know, um, Saudi Arabia makes its m has made its fortune out of selling oil to countries that then go into crisis because they can, you know, because of the economic price they pay for that, and then they construct the idea of sustainability. And then it's set back to Saudi Arabia to be the place where the larger, largest projects that are supposed to be sustainable cities are implemented. In other words, it, there is a sort of funny cycle of ideas where oil is being produced, oil is a crisis. We then, you know, Western, decide that that's no longer feasible that we should be sustainable and that we assume that and then we send it back. Right? And for me, that's something particularly weird in that economy of ideas. But it's also interesting that in this idea uh, that for us, we have a shopping mall here, which is one of the largest in America, is gold lead certified uh, and it needs 5,000 cars every day to get there. Right? So how do we measure and understand this idea of sustainability as well? I'm, I'm being rhetoric in my, in my points, but I'm curious about you know, this cycle of ideas, because similarly, your project needs 60,000 cars, and each one of these street, you know, the, the Mirage needs, uh, I don't know how many cars, but it, it's elevated from this city for by one floor in order to accommodate that, right? Um, I guess part of my question is how does the, you know, in your experience, your interaction with the clients or with the local community, how does that conversation evolve? How, you know, who sets those parameters and how does the interaction take place? Um, you could say in terms of sustainability, when we started up, uh, the client were, why? Mm. I mean, we have all the oil that we can imagine. Right. We don't need it. Uh, so it was your idea. And yeah. That's what I wanted to understand. I mean, we, we pulled the question. And, and um, not only in terms of like economic, but also the social thing with having outdoor spaces for the people. But that was also a part of um, all the study trips that we made with the client and client consultants and so on was to find a um, a common language so that we could actually um, ensure that at least uh, the, the the sustainability profile that we have within the office is fulfilled and I mean and that's also I mean from my point of view it's you have to do that. It's Mother Earth, Earth we're talking about. So even though you have oil just underneath, then it's always better to, to, um, to use as little, of course, as possible. But, but f it was, we, we did pull the question. And, but of course, the client could um, see, especially over time, that there was a, the, there was a, um, a, a need for sustainable solutions, also in terms of the new generation. The new generation also wants um, sustainable solutions. So, yeah. 
Anyone have a question? Here, this one works. You were mentioning that uh, uh, these cities are not being built in a vacuum, that they're based on a lot of cultural variety as well as climate and demographics. But do you feel that perhaps because of these demographics and because of this goal of becoming a more global city, that the cities in trying to modernize are perhaps trying to glaze over more traditional aspects of their culture to be more open to the world? I can, I can start. Um, I, I, I can only say it from a Riyadh or from a European Riyadh <laughs> point of view, but no, I don't, th I don't see it as that they are trying to um, like, uh, get rid of the history. I just see it as a, as a step that has taken maybe longer than normal, <laughs> but I also see it as um, I could say a kind of respect for the old city that they have there, and, and then there has been an eye-opener somehow. So I don't see it as they are trying to become the new US or anything. I just see it as a very natural, but of course fast way of developing. Uh, I would uh, agree with Sonia that uh, indeed uh, kind of historical references play a, play a part very much so in uh, a lot of the work, uh, at least that I've noticed. Uh, if not just as symbol, and not necessarily as a kind of a performance, uh, whether, of course, there are attempts to kind of show sustainability as something looking back uh, to the roots. Uh, Sonia showed the pictures of Aria, the use of shade, etc. cetera. Um, but it often becomes a kind of, um, uh, for architects not from the region, it becomes a kind of, um, uh, non-dynamic list of references uh, that somehow get played out whether in form or in kind of characterization of texture. I'll leave it at that. I think there is, there is a microphone coming your way. Oh, Munira is the, the boss. <laughs> she decides. So um, this is kind of a follow-up to what uh, Aaron asked. And in this exchange of cultures between um, you know, the Arab client and then the Western consultant, uh, one thing that we've seen is the rise of the, you know, know the word for it, indentured servants from South Asia as this kind of extra relic that's left. Many of them don't have control of their own passports. So this big, I think that if you could really simplify it, it is down to these three cultures, the, the client, the builder, and then the leftover people from this exchange of having to build, and quickly. Um, <laughs> I, 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 that, it's a very difficult question to answer, I would say. Of course, there is um, a lot of foreigners, as you say, uh, working as on site. Uh, I don't know how, how it will develop politically, but, but I think by time it has to develop because, I mean, the amount of people, of foreigners within the region is quite big. Um, but I don't, I don't know if, if they will get the opportunity to move to the next level, you could even say. Um, I hope so, um, but, but I don't know. Uh, first of all, just to, for some uh, uh, information, 80% also includes Arabs from other places. Um, um, and also there are, um, I guess, yeah, this is, I could talk for an hour about this, so I'm trying to reach for my best uh, thoughts. Um, maybe the, the one kind of avenue I'll take, which because, only because it's connected to what I've been talking about today, which is this notion of checklists and criteria. Um, uh, I think perhaps the most vocal um, component of uh, for for the for the well-being of people who are known um, 
as laborers, but you also have, of course, domestic servants um, and other kinds of people that might fit into this category. And there are more categories than the three you mentioned. There are, there's much more complexity at hand. Um, but nevertheless, this becomes a, a, a very kind of um, yeah, a charged issue. Um, and what I'm curious about is kind of the effects of, of groups like Human Rights Watch, uh, which have written reports and are a kind of very good at getting press. They're able to get a front page New York Times placement. Um, but my, my question then is what actually happens as a result and, and kind of what then becomes the criteria upon which this is made. Mind you, at the same time that human, someone from Human Rights Watch is chastising what's now, for instance, moved on to Qatar, um, it's at the same time you'll have the Prime Minister of the Philippines uh, visiting the UAE saying, we love being your number one source of labor. We have a great relationship. Um, there's concern when uh, Saudi Arabia says no more people from Bangladesh because of a kind of uh, a, a reaction to a political condition in Bangladesh. So there are kind of multiple sides to kind of desire and non-desire here. Um, but looking at cr criteria and kind of checklists, if you look at least as how I see, for instance, a city like Dubai responding to Human Rights Watch, is actually further development of labor camps. Um, if you visit a labor camp maybe 10 years ago, uh, eight years ago, even before Human Rights Watch started to, to publish, um, they were much simpler than now. They're now being kind of stacked on top of one another. Uh, they're being moved out of the city center, so where they were actually had access to taxis, and I'm talking specifically about uh, labor, uh, construction laborers, where they actually had con uh, access to taxis, uh, group taxis and bus stops, They've now um, being shipped out to almost to the Abu Dhabi border, where they're actually living in what's close to a prison, where they check in, check out. They're not allowed to cook. They're not allowed to do their own laundry. They're allowed to cook water. Um, so you have to start to look at what, what happens when people intercede for other people. While the issues, more, perhaps it's well-meaning, I start to question kind of then what is that source of, of helping these people? I, I'll keep going if you want. <laughs> well then, yeah, I'll try to build on these two. The, the, the thing I'm thinking after I hear you say the air is as hot as a hair dryer, and then we have a sense of a, a political division of classes that might be as extreme as anywhere in the world and as much as it's top-down planned. Were, are there any inadvertent misrecognitions that are the byproduct of an extreme sustainable situation it's an extreme political situation well that nobody nobody set out to solve and make a workers housing more comfortable and it doesn't sounds like it's ended up less comfortable in the example you just gave but has, have there been any pro innovative things that came out of this that nobody set out to produce that are the result of either situation being so extreme and influencing the other, like when you mentioned the swimming pool, it sounds like, again, that could have been, well, what an extremely comfortable thing to do in a hot climate, but yet it's trumped by a cultural condition which says we forbid pools, so I, no innovation there, and no innovation in the jail, but has anything sprung up in the face of these extremes? There might be, but I, the only thing that I can think of now is the swimming pool. But I mean, in the beginning, the, for example, the monorail was also a new thing. We had to go to Disneyland to, to get a common reference to, to find a solution. Um, but on the other hand, the good thing about doing these things are that, that for example, then we started with the monorail. Now they are planning to have a metro in, in Riyadh. That should also be for, for, for example, people from the Bangladesh and so on. And in the beginning, we were thinking of should, should there then be two classes? Should there be women's department and men's department, one trained for women? One, uh, but everything has been, no, there shouldn't. And I mean, in that case, I think that they're developing. But I, of course, the, you, ha you see these labors everywhere. You even see it in my country as well. Um, and the, it's not an excuse, but what you could say is that I know that at our site, there is quite a good um, not conditions, I wouldn't say, but there is 
in terms of working there is good condition. They are all wearing a helmet, which is new in the region. So, um, I mean, it's maybe two steps and then one back, but by time I think it's developing. But of course, there is a huge difference between people, but as I understand this city, you have the exact same problem, <laughs> just in another scale, of course. But um, yeah. I promise to be brief this time. Uh, at the expense of, don't. <laughs> Um, at, at the expense of sounding like a We Are the World hymn, um, I, I will just look at uh, kind of one, uh, one maybe aspect of Dubai, uh, which I think everyone kind of rolled their eyes at, uh, which is a kind of the, the importation or the copying of the Las Vegas fountain, which sings to you a Whitney Houston song or a, uh, I don't know what else. Um, but it was, yeah, it kind of represented the mollification of the city. Um, nevertheless, the, there's a weird moment that happens when it's about time to hear Andrea Bocelli. And everyone comes to the fountain. And actually, you see people who are, you know, you'll hear are not allowed to get into the mall, um, have actually figured out ways to get into a mall. And there are moments where you're just like, wow. I've never seen this many people in the world before at one place looking at a fountain that was brought in from Las Vegas. I have a conclusion, Professor Sunin, and uh, thank you, Note. Uh, I just want the address of the mall. Right, so I thank you. <laughs> I want to thank the speakers first and uh, really thank you for coming, uh, Sonia, from a, a long way from Co Copenhagen and Tadrius from New Heaven, but also a long way commuting at New York. So thank you all for taking the time to get here and for preparing the notes. And really, this brought up an interesting discussion. And uh, we'll give you some time to get uh, coffee outside and prepare for the next session. But, uh, Thank you all for attending too. Great.